previously at the end of my Jason Todd trilogy. I said that Jason Todd was one of those few characters who benefited from the New 52's continuity reboot. And in this video, I will be talking about another character who was given a boost from it. Aquaman, who along with Green Lantern and The Flash were given publicity boosts from the writer Jeff Johns. Johns had previously written Rebirth for both Hal Jordan and Barry Allen with follow-up stories like The Blackest Night and Flashpoint, but since that latter story had led to the New 52's continuity reboot, the topic of today's video was left without a Rebirth story, because the version of Aquaman in it was, for all intents and purposes, a newer and younger incarnation who didn't need a separately told origin story. Also, because of the New 52's Aquaman's monthly comic book was also written by Jeff Johns, so he pretty much balanced it out with the first 13 issues with everything else Aquaman was going through in the present day of the New 52 in leading up to the throne of Atlantis. That story then also happened to be a crossover event with the New 52's Justice League title, which Jeff Johns was also writing at the time, so it was all all jammed into what his editors were allowing Johns to write. Pretty much like with the first six issues of the New 52's Justice League run, Throne of Atlantis was adapted into an animated movie set in the DC animated original movie universe as a direct sequel to Justice League War, and some years later, James Wan also adapted some parts of it into his 2018 Aquaman movie starring Jason Momoa. And since that movie's sequel is due to come out soon, I might as well cover Throne of Atlantis with how its adaptation translated from comic to screen, as some background slash led up information from before the story actually starts. I should probably bring up how Aquaman, or Arthur Curry as he was born, lived in his father's lighthouse in the beginning of the New 52 series with Mera, a Xebelian waterbender princess whose image had not been tainted by Amber Heard yet, and the relationship between the two was multiple times better than with what I I have heard about her and Johnny Depp. The stories leading up to Throne of Atlantis included the threat of the Trench, which could simply be described as humanoid piranhas, and which Aquaman and Mera were able to seal under the sea floor with a volcanic eruption. That story also introduced Dr. Stephen Singh, a disgraced marine biologist who had helped a younger Arthur learn about his origins when growing up as a human-Atlantean hybrid, and whom Arthur treated coldly and unfriendly when an adult because because Dr. Shin had also tried to exploit the knowledge of Atlantis to become recognized for his work. As this was before Justice League became a thing, with Aquaman being one of them, no one believed Dr. Shin and his reputation was so ruined. So, he sought out a treasure hunter who ended up being Black Manta, aka Aquaman's arch nemesis. That adversity began when Manda broke into Arthur's home for evidence about Atlantis, and the sight of him caused Arthur's father Thomas to suffer a heart attack, and Arthur, in seeing Black Manta as having caused his father's death, comprehended it as murder. So, in a fit of rage, Arthur killed Black Manda's father as revenge, but only in mistaking Black Manda's father as Manda himself. That tragedy had happened because of Dr. Shin's ambitions, so no wonder why Arthur treated him that coldly. Meanwhile, in the New 52 Justice League comics, after issue 6, the Justice League comic jumped back to the then-present day. Their next story after Darkseid's invasion was titled The Villain's Journey, where Steve Trevor was thrown under the bus by having him work as the Justice League's liaison with the United Nations in a seemingly thankless job, and he also broke up off-panel with Wonder Woman, who in a friendly way to describe it put him into the friend zone. To add insult to that injury, he was also hounded by paparazzis, and was then caught as bait by that story's antagonist, who wanted to get revenge against the Justice League for causing his family to die as byproduct of their fight against Darkseid. TLDR. All that led to Superman and Wonder Woman entering a relationship, and that is the status quo for them during the Throne of Atlantis. Also, 
Hal Jordan had to leave the team because he didn't have a Green Lantern ring anymore in the New 52's Green Lantern comics, which I'm not going to explain further because this is starting to get too far from the video's intended topic. Here are the time codes on where the review on the comic starts. If you want to skip the story commentary, this is where I will be talking about the animated movie, and this is where I will be listing out what inspirations the 2018 Aquaman movie took from the comic. Now let's dive into the throne of Atlantis. Aquaman Volume 7, Issue Number 0 In the wake of his father's death and the press coming to ask if Dr. Shin is telling the truth about Atlantis, young Arthur Curry in his teenage angst runs away from home and into the sea. After having different interactions with the sea life with his marine telepathy, Arthur returns to the surface to find a boat caught in a storm and saves the sailing father and daughter from hitting the rocks. Once the storm has calmed down, the sailor's daughter approaches Arthur, for clearly more than one reason, but mostly to ask their rescuer where he came from. Arthur expositions that he is the son of the Queen of Atlantis and is unsuccessfully looking for her in the ocean. The old sailor then tells Arthur that he knows a man in Norway who claims to be from Atlantis, and having seen Arthur do what he did to save him and his daughter, has now made the sailor believe that man named Vulko may have been telling the truth. When Arthur finds Vulko, the old man recognizes him as his queen's son and bows before him before Arthur tells him to treat him normally. Vulko when asked tells Arthur that he used to be an advisor for Arthur's grandfather and mother, whose name was Atlanta and is sadly long gone by now. Vulko also tells Arthur how his parents met and fell in love, which was seen as a taboo in Atlantis. Meaning that when Atlana was discovered to be pregnant with Arthur, she left him to be raised by his father. Atlana was also forced to marry the captain of the Atlantean Guard to give birth to a pure Atlantean heir, and so Arthur has a younger half-brother named Orm. When Orm turned 12, his father was killed, and Atlana wanted to leave to join Arthur and his father while bringing Orm with her. But she was murdered the night before Vulko could arrange their way out. Vulko blamed the 12 year old Orm, which then led to his exile to Norway, where Arthur found him at, and Orm has been the king of Atlantis ever since. Having found the other son of his beloved queen, Vulko offers to take Arthur to Atlantis to visit his mother's grave and face his younger brother sitting at the throne. That is where this flashback issue ends, with Vulko leading Arthur to Atlantis. Aquaman Volume 7, Issue Number 14. In the present day scenes happening in this issue, Arthur, now as Aquaman, summons his brother King Orm to meet with him at a sunken ship, where Arthur asks his brother if he knows about Black Manta having been hired by someone from Atlantis to steal Atlantean relics like the Dead Man's Scepter and to attack him. King Orm denies these accusations and just asks Arthur to ask him if he is suspected of planning an attack on the surface, which Orm also denies when asked. Here we also get some exposition to what happened after the Zero issue, that Orm is still the king of Atlantis because Arthur refused to take a throne, as well as that Orm has some told not experienced views of the surface world where Arthur lives in, and that he strongly fears to imagine how his brother lives up there. During this meeting, Vulko is also shown to be informed of a dead Atlantean soldier which causes him to dive into the ocean, and Black Manta is shown to be held captive at Del Reeve, ranting about how powerful Aquaman is while also refusing to join the Suicide Squad. At the sunken ship, Orm then recounts the ship's history to Arthur as having belonged to a crew of sailors who had caught and slaughtered a past king and queen of Atlantis, for which their subjects then sunk the ship and left the crew alive to drown at the sea. All but the captain drowned to be taken to the shore, where he then demanded to be taken back to go down with his ship. Orm uses this story as a reminder to Arthur of Atlantis's power, and that if he wanted to, he could attack all the ships at the sea. But out of respect for his brother, Orm will not do so and wishes not to, which is the last thing he tells Arthur before departing. This issue then ends with a cliffhanger showing someone using the Dead King's scepter to break the seal keeping the trench in their captivity and releasing them back into the ocean.
Justice League Volume 2 is U15. In mid-Atlantic, fishes flee away from a location where US Navy warship USS Magus is conducting a missile test that fails immediately when the missiles end up getting fired 40 minutes too soon, and into completely different coordinates at the bottom of the sea. Or to be clear, the missiles are fired at Atlantis where they blow up, while the Navy believes there to be nothing to shoot at down there. Meanwhile, in Smallville, Superman and Wonder Woman, who have recently entered a relationship, are changing into civilian clothes so they can go on a date, which is something Clark apparently has to teach to Diana as it is a foreign concept to her. In the Justice League Watchtower, Cyborg is told about the failed missile test by his father Silas Stone, along with the fact that the US Navy has lost contact with USS Magus and that one of the Admirals personally asked Silas to ask Victor to look into it. Going to investigate the site would require Victor to replace his remaining lung to make him able to breathe underwater and not drown. But before they can arrange that, the connection is cut between them. Cyborg calls about it to Batman, who is busy chasing after Scarecrow's goons on the Batboat in Gotham Bay. But the situation is dealt quickly when Aquaman shows up to remind them they are in his element. As the GCPD comments about how that turned out, Aquaman tells Batman that the fishes are swimming away from the entire northeastern seaboard, which is alarming because the last time that happened was when he faced off against the trench, so this could be a Justice League level problem. Then Mera shows up by subduing one of Scarecrow's ghouls who tries to resist the arrest, and joins the conversation by adding that she has followed enough different schools of fish to learn they are just swimming away and not into any particular direction. Batman then mentions USS Magus that he heard about from Cyborg, of which neither Aquaman or Mera seem to know about. Meanwhile, Clark and Diana are on their date at Metropolis, with Clark having been able to impress Diana by how no one seems to recognize them while wearing glasses and normal people clothes, but also in taking advantage over the fact that most people believe they are Superman and Wonder Woman 24-7. Then their date gets interrupted by a blackout, followed by a huge storm and tidal wave from the sea throwing multiple ships at Metropolis, meaning that Superman and Wonder Woman need to fly in to protect the fleeing masses who also include Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen. They focus their efforts into holding USS Magus, which still has its crew inside, while Superman also uses his heat vision to vaporize the seawater flooding Metropolis, and Lois Lane almost drowns when taken by the currents. I've had that dream. Please, please be real, please be real, please be real. Aw, man! To Jared's disappointment, however, Lois is rescued by Vulko, who is visibly fatigued and manages to just barely tell Superman and Wonder Woman that he needs to find Aquaman to stop his brother. Meanwhile in Gotham, Batman, Aquaman and Mera are informed by Cyborg that Boston and Metropolis have been hit by tidal waves, with another one on its way to hit Gotham, so they need to prepare a citywide evacuation. As water is pulled back for that tidal wave, both Aquaman and Mera recognize that the tidal waves are first strikes in the Atlantean war plans that Aquaman himself wrote, and his brother King Orm is now executing. Aquaman Volume 7, Issue 15 as the tidal wave hits Gotham and floods the city, Aquaman and Batman cooperate to rescue as many people as possible to the rooftops, while Mera uses her waterbending power to push as much of the water as she can back to the ocean. They regroup on one of the rooftops where Aquaman managed to also rescue Commissioner Gordon and Lieutenant Bullock onto, where Batman tells them what is going on, and that they were able to rescue as many people as they could thanks to Cyborg's last-minute warning. In Metropolis, Vulko's haste to find Aquaman causes a brief action scene to happen by punching Superman, and then calms down when Wonder Woman points her sword at him, to the point of telling them that Atlantis would not be attacking if Arthur was their king. And in the next scene, Batman and Aquaman have left Mera to work with Commissioner Gordon and Lieutenant Bullock to recover the bodies, while they are flying on the Batplane and discuss of the Atlantean war plans that Aquaman had written with his brother as a younger man. 
Arthur hypothesizes that Atlantis would be attacking unless they were provoked with USS Magus failed missile test, which coupled with the Atlanteans interactions with murderous sailors and environmental disasters could have pushed them to this attack. Despite Batman pointing out that they have killed people, Aquaman argues that they can kill even more if they are threatened, so they need to apply diplomacy with King Orm. Arthur then confesses that after he was brought to Atlantis by Vulko as a young man, he had been welcomed with open arms by everyone and Orm handed over the throne to him. But after some time his status as a half-human surface dweller caused dissension and demands to reinstate Orm. Arthur in trying to be one of them caused him to see the surface world as ugly as they did until Darkseid attacked, and being with the Justice League helped him find a place to belong. Batman empathizes with what Arthur tells him, but reminds him that there is no rationalizing this attack, and if Orm is leading it, then it is the duty of the Justice League to bring him down. And then the Atlanteans shoot at the Batplane as an attempt to take Batman out, which Aquaman explains to have been written as a countermeasure against him for having foreseen Batman as a necessary threat to take out in a war like this. Osta sarkasmia? Ei, se oli ironiaa. No toi oli sarkasmia. No tää oli sarkasmia joo. Cyborg then calls Batman and Aquaman to the Watchtower, where Superman and Wonder Woman have brought Vulko, whom Arthur introduces to them as the closest thing he has to a parental figure, and Vulko tells Arthur that some third party has caused this war to erupt. Both Arthur and Vulko agree that they need to confront King Orm with the fact that the missile strike on Atlantis was a mistake, while the rest of the League waits in that King Orm has to answer for the deaths he has caused. As Cyborg notices Atlantis having moved to the coast of Boston, Aquaman tells him to go find Dr. Shin before Atlantis does while he goes to confront his brother, while Batman agrees by giving Arthur one chance to it. In Boston, King Orm is confronting sailors struggling in a storm and demanding them to tell him where their king, whom he believes to be Arthur, is. When Arthur arrives, he has to explain to Orm's limited knowledge on the surface world that he doesn't rule over them, as well as notice that Orm has left his forces below the waves to wait for his signal. Orm then, to his arrogance and narrow-minded views of the surface world, refuses to believe when Arthur tries to explain that a mistake has happened, and tells him that Atlantis will sink Boston to the sea as a cautionary tale to warn the surface dwellers not to cross them again. That then causes Superman, Wonder Woman and Batman to arrive in recognizing that Aquaman is not making any progress with Orm, whose limited knowledge on the surface mistakes them for his brother's masters, and Arthur is so forced to physically show him they are not. Justice League Volume 2 is 16. In the Justice League Watchtower, Vulko explains to Cyborg how much Dr. Shin knows about Atlantis and Aquaman, that the Atlanteans might see his knowledge as a threat to stopping them, which sends Cyborg to go collect him and face off against the assassin sent to kill him. In Boston, Aquaman is forced to keep King Orm from rising the Atlantean forest from the sea and the Justice League from attacking them. Orm, however, grows tired of the charade blade before him and has his army rise from the ocean to attack everyone, in also seeing that the surface world has poisoned his brother's mind. Meanwhile, Cyborg manages to rescue Dr. Shin from the assassins to the Watchtower, as Superman decides to do his freeze breath and heat division on the waters, which causes Orm to retaliate by using his trident to control the storms, and one-shot all the Justice Leaguers present, including his brother, who are then taken to what Orm calls Dark Waters. Vulko informs Cyborg about this when he returns to the Watchtower with Dr. Shin, while Orm rises an Atlantean war machine from the ocean, so with the Flash and Green Lantern absent, Cyborg goes to Star Labs Detroit, Michigan, where his father works at for those augmentations they talked about earlier. That would however leave all the active members of the Justice League out of commission, so before going under for that operation, Cyborg sends a message 
to a number of independently working heroes and deputizes them into the Justice League as reinforcements. Aquaman Volume 7 Issue 16 While Cyborg is put under for the operation, Vulko and Dr. Shin observe a news report on the events of what happened in the previous issue, on which Vulko blames on Dr. Shin for having wanted to be recognized as the man who discovered Atlantis by outing Arthur, with that act having snowballed into the current situation where Aquaman and the Justice League have been taken to the dark waters. There Aquaman has already managed to free himself of his bindings to find Batman, just barely keeping himself alive with his equipment while inside a pod, as well as using sonar to map out where they are. At the place where Aquaman and Mera trapped the trench, which they now learn to have been freed out of. This causes Arthur to suspect or may have released them with the Dead King Scepter and caused USS Magus missile test failure to justify this war. Meanwhile in Boston, Hawkman, Firestorm, Vixen, Black Lightning, Black Canary, Atomica and Element Woman are shown fighting against the Atlantean forces, while King Orm is instructing them to place detonators around the city to sink it. By this time, Cyborg's operation has been finished and he joins Mera to go after the location of Batman's beacon. Back at the Dark Waters, Aquaman and Batman in looking for Superman and Wonder Woman discover engravings of the Dead King's scepter being used to free the trench and lead them, before they then find Superman and Wonder Woman used as a lure by the creatures. Luckily, Mera and Cyborg then arrive via a boom tube and keep the trench at bay, while also helping Superman and Wonder Woman be freed and get Batman up from the water pressures too dangerous for normal humans. However, the trench are now fully freed and driven to the surface to attack the Atlanteans. Which means that Orm does not have the Dead King Scepter, and someone else started this war by freeing the trench with it, and that someone else is revealed to be Vulko as this issue ends. Justice League Volume 2 Issue 17 By the time the Justice League has returned to the Watchtower, they find Dr. Shin beaten up as confirmation that Vulko is behind everything. Mera suspects that he is doing this as an act of revenge for his exile, while the media is reporting about what is happening in Boston causing Arthur to blame himself for having given up his throne to Orm. Batman and Wonder Woman while restocking and rearming themselves tell Arthur he is not to blame, and the responsibility on the war with Atlantis is something he shares with them. In Boston, the Atlantis vs. the Justice League recruits vs. the trends continues, and it looks like like Satan has also joined the fight, with their uncoordinated fighting making it easier for Atlantis to remain on the top until the core Justice League shows up. While Cyborg moves to disable the Atlantean bombs and Batman takes over directing the recruits to find Vulko, Aquaman attacks King Orm in trying to stop what he is doing as well as to explain that Vulko is behind everything. Unfortunately, Orm's ward view of the surface world causes him to believe both Vulko and Arthur to have been corrupted by the surface, and then fights Arthur while trying to justify his actions as having wanted to save his brother from the cruelty of the surface ever since he learned of Arthur's existence. But recognizing that Arthur's loyalty is now to the surface world as Aquaman, Orm has his responsibilities to Atlantis to do as he has to. Luckily, while he has been fighting his brother, Cyborg and Atomica have managed to disable one of the bombs, while Superman and Wonder Woman fly the other bomb to blow up in the sky. As his backup plan, Orm tries to use his crown to control the ocean in another form of waterbending to claim Boston, but Mera's waterbending and Satana's magic manages to counter that attack by holding the water before turning it into ice, that then covers Boston from the ocean like a dam. Arthur then tells Orm he was happy to learn he had a brother, and so didn't feel as alone as he would have had he taken the crown. But the circumstances now force Arthur to take the throne from Orm in telling him to yield, which Orm does without having anything to fight with anymore. While Batman and the recruits find Vulko, Arthur needs to remind the rest of the Atlantean forest surrounding them that HE IS THEIR KING NOW that Orm has yielded. 
julkaisu rendersästi Atlanteans bow before Aquaman as their new king, who orders them to cease their war with the surface and instead focus on to pushing the trench back into the sea with the Justice League. In the middle of all that, Vulkosu renders the dead king's scepter to Arthur and confesses to his crimes in having done everything just so that Arthur would embrace his birthright as the true king of Atlantis. Arthur naturally reacts to this betrayal as a hero like Aquaman should, but ultimately takes the scepter and uses it to send the trench creatures back to where they came from. Next he tells the Atlanteans to take Vulko to Atlantis to wait for his day in court, while also being forced to arrest Orm for his war crimes to be incarcerated on the surface, because he also forfeit any diplomatic immunity of a foreign leader when he yielded the throne to Arthur. In the aftermath of the war, Orm is imprisoned in Belle Reve and being dubbed by the media as the supervillain Ocean Master, while Arthur is forced to move from his father's lighthouse to Atlantis now that he is their king, with Mera not being able to join him because she is from Xebel. Dr. Shin is also now given the recognition he had wanted, but clearly doesn't anymore as the media is now painting Aquaman and Atlantis in a dangerous light, while the Justice League has to open up their ranks as the US government is also building their own Justice League, and an unseen third party is also doing the same with villains. Throne of Atlantis is nowadays seen as many things, such as the story where the New 52's Justice League series grew a beard, as well as the modern establishment on who Aquaman is as a character. Not as a joke character who can only talk to the fishes, but rather as a serious character with death as a half-human, half-Atlantean, with his birthright to the titular Throne of Atlantis putting him into a Cain and Abel situation with his full Atlantean brother Orm. Although that latter thing can depend on the writer, with Jeff Johns having made both Arthur and Orm be brothers who love and care about each other. Like Flashpoint, however, Throne of Atlantis is a story that has a noticeable amount of build up to it. In the leading issues of Jeff Johns' run on Aquaman, he had to establish the existence of the Trench and the Dead King Scepter, how Aquaman and Black Manta became enemies, even when Manta was barely used in the story, what Aquaman's connection is to Atlantis with Dr. Shin, Vulko and Orm, and I suppose Mera is also a character who requires some explanations. But the main story itself was told with a seemingly well-balanced narrative, told back and forth between the New 52's Aquaman and Justice League comic series, without having any surplus special issues to expand it, like how Gotham War did by ending on a separate special issue. That helped the story be told as quickly as it was needed without ending up wearing off its welcome, as well as to set up what was coming after it with Trinity War and Forever Evil storylines. Aquaman was also made to be the clear main protagonist with the Justice League as his supporting characters, with making Vulko be the secret bad guy wanting to make Arthur be the King of Atlantis coming across as a bold move, while Orm was portrayed both as a tragic villain and a red herring antagonist. Although I must admit that if USS Magus failed missile test was indeed an accident, then it was extremely lucky that it happened around the same time when Vulko went to release the trench creatures from their captivity. All in all, this was a surprisingly simply told premise with a bittersweet ending, where a seemingly good man decided to become a terrorist so that what he believed in would become reality. In other words, a typical villain's journey. With Superman and Wonder Woman also starting out their relationship in the middle of it. And speaking of which, back in my Justice League War and Snyder Cut video, I called their relationship as a bad idea, but by now I can be open-minded enough to acknowledge that when it came to the New 52 versions, this was a previously underutilized idea that worked with these incarnations of the characters, and it separated them from the post-crisis versions. I actually agree with Jared in saying that they wouldn't have needed to be broken up 
up when the DC rebirth happened, because at the very least those two could have stuck with each other until the new 52 Superman died and the post crisis Superman was brought to take his place. That way those two could have gotten the till death do us part without being broken up by Peter Tomasi when he took over their shared title. I mean, if it was supposed to happen anyway, then what would have been the harm in keeping them together until it happened? And that's about all the support I'm giving to the Super Wonder Shippers, which happens to be more than I have given to the Wonder Bat Shippers. Good show! Good show! I should probably still acknowledge the art by Ivan Reis and Paul Pelletier, which do complement each other at least that much that going from Aquaman's comic to the Justice League comic doesn't come across as distracting. Although I suppose the coloring by Rod Reis with both tries to make it come across as the same, or bring up some differences with both artist styles. Okay, who were in charge of the animated movie? Ethan Spaulding and Heath Carson. Now where do I know those names? Alright, the former directed the Son of Batman movie, and the latter one brought Justice League War. Well, I did acknowledge in that video how Shazam replaced Aquaman because this was meant as a sequel to that movie, so let's see how well that thought process went out. My expectations were not exactly high, but MITÄ VITTUA! Okay, I did acknowledge that this movie was meant to be a direct sequel to Justice League War, and that Throne of Atlantis itself was somewhat consented story with a lot of needed build-up setting it up. The Aquaman issue 0 and 14 were that set up, and the Justice League issue 15 forward was the main event where Atlantis attacked the eastern seaboard. That happens later in the third act, while the first act tries to balance out what the Justice League status quo is like how the villains journey did, as well as being an Aquaman origin movie. And the second act is pretty much a rehash of the Enemy Below episode from the DC AU's Justice League cartoon. That is pretty much a quick summary of this animated movie, and now I'm going to showcase and comment what things in it were the same as in the comic, and which were changed. We can start from the opening scene, where USS Magus is replaced with a nuclear submarine that is just randomly attacked by Atlanteans, sent by Orm who is not the king of Atlantis. Apparently, Atlanta's husband did not die when Orm was 12, and lived to die as collateral damage when Darkseid invaded. That so probably caused Atlanta to grow more focused on taking over leading Atlantis instead of leaving it to join Thomas and Arthur. In seeing how Orm is actually an adult, or a man-child when that happened, she clearly knew she couldn't convince him to leave with her, or leave him in charge. And speaking of Orm... People and Sam Witwer is so good for this. Am Sam Witwer is so good for this movie. <laughs> Sam Witwer is so good for this movie. Sam Witwer who plays Orm is too good for this movie and the characterization given to Orm. This guy was not the king of Atlantis, who decided to treat the surface world the same way how treated Atlanteans, and was not only a more fantastical racist at them, but also had no brotherly empathy towards Arthur in wanting to save him from the surface. In fact, if the comic version of Orm and this movie's version of Orm were put into the same room, the comic Orm would beat his movie counterpart up while ranting at him like he did at Arthur in the comic about how much of a better man he is. The movie's version of Orm not only sent an unprovoked attack on the nuclear sub, but also conspired with Black Manta to use the nuke from the sub to attack Atlantis for justification to attack the surface viewed Arthur as a half brief bastard and committed matricide when he was caught. Your transparent aggression towards the surface world has left Atlantis exposed, Orm. Do you deny it? 
That ship would have discovered us. The pact with the trenchers was your idea. They will return hungry for meat. This is all falling apart. Your judgment is compromised. You refuse to attack the surface because you have a son there. A bastard elder son! You speak to me of betrayal? You who spilled Atlantean blood and blamed it on the surface world? This coup Five. is over. Four, I am queen, three, and war two, is not in my plans. One. <laughs> but it is in mine. Wow, I could literally count the down when it happened. Also, the way how Atlana is shown talking down on Orm and treating him like an unwanted middle child is implied to have been a driving factor in forcing Orm to be as irredeemable as he is when compared to his comic book counterpart. Regardless, that latter part is how the Justice League manages to turn Atlanteans against Orm, by the way, by having Cyborg record him confessing it to them and then broadcast it for everyone to see. And all of that could have probably been avoided if Vulko was used in the movie to do what he did in the comic. But seeing how Atlana was changed to be alive and the reigning monarch, Vulko pretty much already had what he wanted in the source material. Then in Vulko's absence, Black Manta was added into this movie as a co-conspirator working with Orn, which wouldn't and shouldn't work because Black Manta is still a surface dweller who is somehow allowed to frolic around Atlantis. There is zero logic to that with how anti-outsider the Atlanteans are portrayed as, and Black Manta's motivations barely get any explanations before he is killed off mid-sentence. What's my doing? With Orm's money issues and sense of entitlement, coaxing him into war was child's play. Frankly, he irks the shit out of me. Once we've sunk the surface world, I'll slit his throat and claim the treasures of Atlantis. <laughs> Outrageous. And that was the only interaction Black Manta had with Aquaman, without any context given to why the two would be enemies, or if they had played any roles in the deaths of their fathers. Pretty much, Black Manta was included in this movie because he is an enemy of Aquaman, but his presence didn't serve any purposes, so he just ended up being wasted. Thomas Curry is said to have died before the events of the movie. But the cause of his death is not explained, and even in life he had decided not to approach Dr. Shin until when he was at his deathbed. And Dr. Shin is also pushed to learn about Arthur by Black Manta as an unexplained part of whatever evil plans he had, and he is then killed off when the movie doesn't need him anymore. Ei vittu miten paska elokuva! I also feel obligated to complain about the way how the character relationships are created in a seemingly rushed fashion. So Superman and Wonder Woman do not have the same slow build-up that would make their relationship feel as natural as it was in the comic, with Diana's initial breakup with Steve Trevor during the villain's journey that led to her and Clark growing closer after that story. So their first scene in the movie where they enter a relationship feels rushed, just so that we could get to the scene of them on a date. I do acknowledge that Justice League War did hint at the mutual attraction between Superman and Wonder Woman, so at the very least it's not like it's coming out of nowhere. Aquaman and Mera's relationship is also somehow supposed to bloom and become a thing during this movie, where she is pretty much just doing what Bulgo would have done in finding and reaching out to Arthur, and they are then supposed to develop a relationship while that is happening, but I don't see it. If you ask me, it would have been better to have some of these relationships to have happened between the movies instead, so we could see them exist and fill in on how they happened without having Sazan act like an overly excited fanboy cheering at them. Dude, are they on a date? I believe you. Of course he does. Oh, I got ham. I got all. Hadn't feasted him up. I felt the electricity over here. Ask her out. Nick, we gotta go. Whoa. Am I interrupting? Yeah, you are. This is even. But we can pick more it up. More cringe. Over dinner. 
What else is there to say? The climax happens in Metropolis instead of Boston, no other heroes are called as reinforcement, and just John Henry Irons gets a brief cameo as a Chekhov's gun to set up for when he later becomes Steel, and Arthur taking over the control of the Atlantean soldiers is lame, compared to his I am your king moment from the comics. Is this the king you want, Atlanteans? A coward who lies to you. Why are there people saying that these movies are good? You need good? a light to guide you in the darkness, people of Atlantis. My people. What are you uh, doing? Becoming a beacon. I was born of two worlds. Atlantean by birth. Human by instinct. Join me. And we will bridge those worlds in peace. This is lame. This is uh, worse than lame. The comic had Arthur be all, all, all yielded. And I am your king. Compared to this, this is lame. Unbelievably lame. The coronation after the fact in Atlantis also has this scene that looks worse than how it was in the original trailer for this movie. He needs a code name. Well, online they're calling him Aquaman. Hate that. Aquaman it is. He needs a code name. Yeah? Well, online they're calling him Aquaman. Hate that. Aquaman it is. Then there is a post credits cliffhanger where Orm is imprisoned at Belle Reve and visited by Lex Luthor with a proposal. But knowing what happened in the following movies, it leads to nothing. Hal Jordan, who was not in the comic either because of what was happening in the Green Lantern comic series at the time, is then added to be the one who intercepts Batman's pursuit of Scarecrow's goons. But because this is written by a probably another Batman worshipping fanboy, Batman treats it more negatively with Hull than how he did it with Arthur in the comic. We're done here. Are we? Who's the supplier for the aerosol component of the fear toxin? Who, who, who's the what now? Who is the Scarecrow targeting in City Hall? No. What about something simple? Like, where's the Scarecrow? Bro, I caught them for you. You're welcome. I didn't know... I didn't need them caught. I needed them scared. I needed information. Next time you want to help, do me a favor. Don't. By the way, thanks to having watched Jared's interview with Sam Liu, I can understand that these movies were pretty much just done for job security. That would explain why Heath Carson didn't get to do more of these movies and was let go to do all of these other projects instead. Okay, and now before I end this video, let's see how much of a better job James Wan did with the 2018 movie with Jason Momoa. My parents made me what I am. In seeing how this movie ended up crossing over a billion dollars at the box office, it must have done something right or the general audience's standards were lower than they are now. Since this movie came out during my amnesia year, I'm not sure if I first saw it when it was in theaters, or that one time I was visiting my sister and randomly decided to watch it together. Anyway, let's not waste any more time and list out the similarities and differences before you actually get bored of watching this video. Number one, both of Arthur's parents are still alive, with the movie also opening with how they met and fell in love. Although Atlana is believed to be dead for most of the movie before she is found out to be alive in her sentenced exile, Arthur also has never been to Atlantis and is rejecting that side of his heritage and responsibilities, so making his character arc be to embrace them. Number two, Vulko's role in the story has him be more reasonable than the well-intentioned extremist he was in the comic, and is working with Mera in trying to plan out a less deadly plan in getting Arthur to the throne in Orm's place. No good deed goes unpunished, however, and he is then imprisoned by King Orm when he decides to stop playing dumb. Number 3. Following either of the Justice League movies, Arthur and Mera are not in a relationship like in the comic, and just like in the animated movie, there is a clumsy attempt to make them become a couple. Number 4. Black Manta is only in this movie as a way of sequel baiting hype for the next movie. 
His pre-black Manta persona as David Hyde or David Kane, as the character has been christened in the recent years on the other hand, is utilized much better than the animated movie's version was. Here he and his father are shown as modern-day pirates attacking a nuclear submarine that King Orm had hired them to commandeer. Then, while Arthur rescues the crew of the submarine, he ends up being responsible for Black Manta's father dying by pulling the You killed innocent people! I won't kill you. You asked to see for mercy. But I don't have to save you. From Batman Begins, when he ends up pinned under a torpedo. That leads to David to become Black Manta as a surplus villain who is later fought by Arthur and pushed off the cliff into the movie's mid credit scene as a cliffhanger. Along with Dr. Shin, whom James Wan has confirmed was added to the movie during the post-production's additional shootings. Number 5. The characterization of King Orm is an interesting mix of both the comic book version and the animated movie version. The prejudiced views that the comic Orm had have been fueled by the pollution of oceans, which is on another reason why he wants to attack the surface, whereas the hostile attitude towards Arthur that the animated version had is downplayed into a form of grown resentment. What I mean by that is that Orm does not hold Arthur's existence against him, except when it is told to have led to their mother's death via exile, and Orm's attitude towards Arthur also comes across like it could have been avoided if Arthur had come to meet him and forged the brotherhood between them when he was initially invited to visit Atlantis as a younger man. In that sense, Arthur had unintentionally pushed Orm into becoming the villain he would become as Ocean Master. That is also how his actor Patrick Wilson sees Orm and how he bases his portrayal of him. Number 6. The Justice League are not featured in the movie as Aquaman's supporting characters because A. This was a solo movie and B. Because this was when Warner Bros. decided to start erasing the previous movies directed by Zack Snyder without any backup plans on how to replace his five movie plan. Although, according to some recently resurfaced concept arts, Batman was supposed to have some kind of supporting role cameo. But with the situation that Ben Affleck was in after the Justice League reshoots, it's no wonder why he would have been cut out. Number 7. The trench are used as a stepping stone slash obstacle between Arthur and Mera in reaching the uncharted sea where Atlana is found alive and where Arthur must recover the Dead King Scepter that has been compositioned with his trident to control all marine life, including the trench. Number 8. Orm's Ocean Master moniker is reimagined as a title for a leader commanding the Seven Kingdoms under the sea. That means that he spends most of his time trying to convince them to put him in charge, including murdering the ruling monarch and placing the heir of the Fisherman Kingdom in charge as his vassal. Number 9. Orm never actually gets to attack the surface outside of one early warning shot attack in throwing a couple of tsunami at the coastal cities. And before receiving the Ocean Master title, he is slowed down when the Kingdom of the Brine gives him and his allied kingdoms a hostile welcome. That so buys Arthur and Mera time to intercept them with the control over the trench creatures and the Karathian to enter the conflict as a third party, and isolate Orm into a confrontation on the surface where Arthur beats him into surrendering, yielding the throne to him, and revealing to him's brother that their mother is still alive. Orm is then imprisoned to be trialed in Atlantis, as he never got to kill any humans on the surface, and Arthur tells him they can try to build a brotherhood between each other while he serves his sentence. That is likely what James Wan is going to explore in the Aquaman and Lost Kingdom movie. But for a spiritual adaptation as well as an original story and a solo movie, Aquaman 2018 managed to do enough changes that balanced with the aspects that were carried over from the source material. James Wan clearly had the vision and creative freedom from the studio demands, which makes his Aquaman movie a better adaptation of a comic book story than the 2023's Flash movie. Not exactly a high praise, but that is what we end up with when we only have these lesser peers to compare it to. Looking forward into 2024's comparison reviews, I have collected scans for editing a couple of Superman-related video projects, and seeing how there is a three-parter crisis 
Amazon Infinite Earth movie also on the way, I should also start writing a story commentary and a comic review on it that I can then, as those movies come out, cut into three parts in fitting how well those movies are done. Until then, remember to like this video, comment down your thoughts on what I brought up in it, share the video for more people to see, and subscribe to the channel for those upcoming videos. Also, ding the bell to be alerted for when I'm doing gameplay streams for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.